You're listening to Live Wild Radio, the part-time adventure podcast. Join us as we explore how outdoor adventures build mind, body, and spirit. Welcome back to Live Wild Radio. Uh, today's been a day, so we spent the day outside rock climbing today. September. Yep, it is in September. Uh, which in the climbing community we call September because you tend to have good weather, good temperatures. Um, if you've been training all summer and climbing a lot, you might be in good shape. Uh, I can't claim any of those things. <laughs> I climbed a lot. Uh, yeah, I'm still this you fat. Did. I'm still fat and old. But um, yeah, but we had a great day climbing. Yeah, it was a good day. It was beautiful weather, and uh, got my arms super pumped. Yeah, had a lot of. Uh, Adamandra screams going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think his are, his are very like karate screams. Yours are, yours were a lot of like I'm gonna throw up. If only we had climbing names like you had trail names and backpacking. Yeah, call me throw up. No, because it's not like a throw up. It's like you're you're uh, like an old person getting out of a chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> It's very. I, I make lots of grunty noises it's very too. Track. So don't you know? Yeah. Don't yeah, and that. you fell today. I did, and yeah. I and I, and I uh, busted up my shin and hurt my ankle. Yeah, because I I actually made it through the crux section of a climb. You did, and I got cocky. I went ah, and I, I sort of instead of like you know statically reaching for the next hold, I sort of did some weird dynamic thing that had no reason to do it. Right, and it turned out the hold I was throwing for wasn't actually a hold. Um, it looked, because there was shadow, it looked like there was something there, and there wasn't, and my hand slipped off, and then I took a little bit of a 15-foot trip in the air. Well, here's what I say. Randy, I don't know his last name, but he's like the president of the Ontario Alliance Climbing Association, OAC. Yeah. He put it up. He says it's 5'6". I'm like, bullshit, because a lot of his climbs routes are not what they are. They're always graded more easy, easier than what they really are, so well, the, we, I claim we, we bullshit. Call, we call that sandbagged. Yeah. And and uh, quite honestly, like I can't fault Randy for I don't even know if he put up the one that I fell on. Uh, it was a great climb. Yeah, but it wasn't a five six. I mean, I think it was help my ego a bit. <laughs> 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 Anyways, okay. we should get on with it. And it makes me feel better. It, it was full of you know, five nine. Yeah, 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 yeah totally, that's totally. why you, that's yeah. why you couldn't do fuck it. that. So yeah. anyway, all right. So today today's topic is all about camp cook systems and water purification water purification and a few recipes to go along the way and food yeah so food mm, you have a addiction to food i think on backpacking trips talk about it okay so i i i don't know about anybody else but again a, a lot of my backpacking sort of uh, DNA came f early in my life, right? So hiking the Bruce when I was 20, the AT when I was 21, you know, like it just becomes sort of, that sort of laid the blueprint for the way I think for the rest of my life. Yeah. So it, even if we're just out for a two-day backpacking trip, like it's it's just an overnighter, yeah. right? The whole time I'm fantasizing about what we're going to eat on the drive home. <laughs> oh, it's ones we get back, right? Right, like it, um, and it's the same thing where, where like if, you know, a few years ago when Katie and I went and hiked the AT, um, many of our conversations were what we were going to eat when we hit town. Yeah. I find it fascinating for me on trips that I eat food that I never would eat when I'm not camp backpacking. For example, ramen noodles, really? But on a trip, it's the salt. Yeah. Pepperettes, ugh. But on a trip, it's the fat. And pepperettes in ramen noodles? That's that's my jam. <laughs> Basically, today we're going to talk about um, camp cooking, food, and water purification. And one of the things that we have to put in, because we're calling it camp cooking, is people need to consider you can actually go no cook. And I know I know it's weird to talk about not cooking when we're talking about camp cooking, but um, but one of the one of the approaches you can take actually is don't take a pot, don't take a stove, don't take fuel. Huge weight savings. Yeah, and you just take food you and can eat. time. Yeah, you can take food that you either can cold soak um, or just eat ready to go. Um, like Sarah Duma, who we've had on the show. Yeah, that was the first time I'd ever heard of that. Actually, aside yeah. from I've seen you, especially during lunches and breakfast, just eat nuts. 
nuts and churn, you know. And bars and granola bars and. Yeah, but yeah. she deliberately does it even for dinner. Yeah, she just goes no cook the whole she time. She goes for candy. Yeah. Which actually is the other element of backpacking. When you're working that hard, it gives you the license to eat. Whatever the hell you want. Sugar. <laughs> yeah. Sugar and fat and. Uh, because the the thing is, if you're putting on 10, 15, 20, 30 kilometers a day, yeah. you're turning into like a Michael Phelps, you know, the Olympic swimmer, where where his thing is just, you know, I, I think when he's in training camp, he's putting down 12,000 calories a day because he's training multiple times a day for hours at a time. He needs the energy. Yeah. Um, and so when you're hiking all day, every day, you need a ton of calories. Like, you know, you're you're looking uh for myself, you know, a two hundred pound guy, um, I'm you know, basically just to to break even, I need to be putting down like on uh long days. You know, so if we if we call it twenty kilometers a day. Yeah. I need to be putting down like four to five thousand calories. Really? When the average consumption is two thousand. Yeah. Because people don't do anything. Yeah, interesting. Right? So if you take your resting metabolic rate, Mm -hmm. um, and then you combine that with hours and hours of exercise, if you don't fuel yourself, your body's going to destroy itself. And we're talking minimum, minimum eight-hour days. Yeah. If not more, sometimes up to 12. Yeah. We've done, we've done, yeah. And like, you know, you're taking breaks and you're having lunch and... Be aware. Breaks especially snack breaks and food breaks can take more time than you think. Yeah. And that, that's something we will cover on trip planning. Um, one of my people ask how I can cover so many miles because I'm not, mm. I'm not a particularly fast hiker and I realize this is a bit of a tangent, but one of the, one of the tricks is start early, go long, don't take a lot of breaks. Yeah. You don't have to go fast. Just go steady. It's true because I'm always amazed when I look at my Garmin InReach Explorer how as much to time how much time we moving. actually, exactly. And it's usually almost half the time, same time as, as walking, as yeah. hiking. It's Whereas like, you what? The, in your head, you've hiked for eight hours. Yeah. But you actually only covered four and a half. Yeah. <laughs> so it's something to keep aware of. And that food systems, like what you take with you in the gear, especially if it takes time to cook your food, can really impact that. But let's we'll, we'll step back a bit. So how do you want to cover this? Do you want to start with food or gear first? Well, let's start with the gear. Okay. Um, so uh, a camp cook kit at its fundamentals is going to be um, a stove with some sort of fuel, mm-hmm. um, a pot, uh, you know, obviously your food and utensils. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when we get into stoves, uh, or or your heat source, we'll call it. Um, generally, we use a stove, but you can also cook over a fire. Mm-hmm. Um, generally, if you're backpacking and you want to cover miles, you're not going to kick over a fire. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're a hiker who likes to camp, exactly where you base camp, you might like that nostalgic taking your time and you know yeah. cooking over a fire, which does take time. Yeah, because if you think about if you're using a uh, isobutane stove, so you have the compressed gas canister, um, you thread your stove on top of it, turn it on, light your stove, put your pot of water on, you're cooking in literally minutes. Um, whereas if you want to cook over a, a fire, you've got to go out and collect wood. You've got to, let's say there is a fire ring for you to have your fire in, like or a fire pit. Um, you've got to prep your wood. You've got to, you know, break things down to kindling, um, get your tinder source together, you know, get your fire lay together, light your fire. Um, and once you get your fire going, it's not ready to cook. That's right. You need a good, uh, bed of coals. Bed of coals. Yeah. Um, so you run into the thing where it cooking over fire is fun. Um, but it's not efficient. Right, so if if you are looking to cover a lot of miles, um, it really isn't your best way to go, especially for like say lunch. Yeah. Oh yeah, you need to be quick. Yeah. I have a question. So why uh, isobutane versus propane? Everybody's used to propane. You know those small propane tank camping with your Coleman stove if you're yeah. car camping. So why not that? So it's too heavy. Is it just heavier uh, density or fuel source? No, it no. It's the container. The propane stored at a higher pressure. So the container has to be beefier, like thicker, oh, to gotcha. take a higher pressure. That's the only reason. Um, and so 
let, I'm going to take a step back and we'll talk about fuel sources for camp stoves. Perfect. So um, the most common is isobutane, which is a mixture of butane and propane um, in these little kind of mushroom shaped uh, cans. Yeah, they usually fit right inside your pot. Um, and they're available in a four ounce can, an eight ounce can or a 16 ounce can. Um, generally for backpacking, you're only going to use the four or the eight Um because an eight will last me for a week. Uh, and you run into the thing where the can, even though it's pressurized, doesn't have to be super thick, right? So the actual holder isn't that heavy. Um, and they're good down to, you know, depending on the stove, like down to minus 10, uh, they'll work. Uh, butane itself will only vaporize at zero Celsius, um, but because you have the mix of protein, propane and butane, um, propane will vaporize at minus 40. Uh, so it is a better fuel for, for colder conditions. Good to know. Um, but uh, the containers, propane is only available, the smallest container is a one pound container or 16 ounce of fuel. And the container, because propane is at higher pressure, it's thick and heavy. Um, so it's just big and dumb and bulky. How much uh, more in weight are we talking? Um, basically, you're talking about double the weight for the fuel. Okay. Um, and so with isobutane stoves, they're small, they're light, like the, the actual fuel source. The stoves themselves are pretty light. Um, your pocket rocket weighs like two and a half to three ounces. Yeah, and it uh, compacts pretty nicely. I usually put my isobutane in my pot along with, with my stove and my fire starter in its own carrying case done. Yeah. And it comes with another mini pot that I cover it all with. Yeah, the lid can be used as a pot as well. Yeah. Um, and then you can also go, because uh, we've talked about isobutane and uh, propane, you can also run liquid fuel stoves uh, like the MSR Whisper Light um, or Dragonfly. The plus of those is that... Um, especially if it's like the Whisper Light International, they'll burn anything. You can run diesel fuel, you can run kerosene, you can run gasoline, you can run white gas or naphtha. Um, there's a bunch of different types of fuel. So if you're traveling all over the world, it might be your best option because um, you can find something that it'll burn. Gotcha. But, you know, because you have liquid fuel, it has to be vaporized to burn. Um so you have to pressurize the canister. Like it, basically the way these fuel stoves work is you have a gas bottle or a fuel bottle um, and the stove has a, a metal hose that goes to the fuel bottle and then there's a pump so you can pressurize the fuel bottle. Um, so you actually have to prime this type of stove. Okay, it uh, sounds complicated. Um, yeah, and so personally, I, I only ever use it uh, if I'm winter camping where I can't run, I can't have a fire. You actually have one? Uh, yeah. I got to find where it is. I haven't used it in years. <laughs> because any of our times that we're at winter camping, we always have a fire. That's right. So we're close enough to the fire. That the isobutane works. Yeah. And so it's simple and efficient. Um, and you're not having to, you know, prime. Um, so the the plus, though, of something like a, an MSR Dragonfly it's a big bulky stove. So if you're, say, cooking a fish, gotcha. it'll support a big ass frying pan. Yeah. I mean, I do that now where I put a frying pan on, what's my stove? Um, your pocket rocket. My pocket. It's super compact. Again, it fits right in the pot yeah. uh, that I have. But but when you got a frying pan on it, it's very to, stable. <laughs> I have to hold the frying pan. Yeah. Yeah. It heats it up very quickly. Certainly. We've done that car camping. And the only time I do that is when I'm car camping because I don't want to carry a pan around. Yeah. So so generally, um, uh, the other the other type of stove you can get is actually an alcohol stove. Um, and if you look on YouTube, you can find videos on how to make your own alcohol stove. Um, you can buy alcohol stoves from Trangia or uh, uh, Vargo um, makes a titanium one What I that I have. Um the plus is that you can find the fuel almost anywhere because it'll burn isopropyl alcohol, which is rubbing alcohol 90% or higher. Um, it'll burn methyl hydrate, which is a type of paint thinner. 
Um, it'll burn denatured alcohol. It'll burn moonshine. <laughs> um, so you, you, shame to waste it, but you know it'll still burn it. Um, but the, so there's a number of fuel sources for it, um, which is on a plus. But they're just slow as shit. So what were people using on the AT? Uh, almost uh, the vast majority were using isobutane stoves, like the pocket rockets. Gotcha. Um, or some people would run the. Uh, uh, jet boils yeah. where the pot I was just gonna and the mention. stove all go together. Yeah, you just screw them in place, which is a really nice feature to keep it um, all tight together. Yeah, the stove's not going to fall off. Yeah. Or the pot's not going to fall off the and stove. And it actually um, boils the water quicker. Yeah, because it has a heat exchanger built in. Mm -hmm. uh, so jet boil or like an MSR reactor um, or wind burner, you know, they're all the same kind of thing where you have a pot and a stove that all, they actually lock together um and they've got a heat exchanger so they're very very efficient yeah um you know it ends up being a hair heavier than having a lightweight pot with a lightweight stove um but it's a you know a viable option so it sounds like that's the one that you'd recommend if you were to buy another one which is the latter the jet boil that uh well i i'm still like it, it depends what your thing is if you want just the lightest system i would get a pocket rocket too okay how much uh for our canadian listeners probably like 60 bucks um you know so probably 50 american and does that that's just the stove it doesn't come with a pot no kit okay um and then uh personally i love the msr titanium tea kettle uh that's what i use as my pot it's like an 800 milliliter pot um how much can, uh they wrote 65 canadian so 50, 55 Canadian uh, or American. No, but it's like four ounces for a pot. Versus what's mine? Uh, yours is about seven. How do you remember this shit? Because I have, if you think about the world as a balanced place, right? Yin and yang and all that stuff. Um, so you have a terrible memory. Um, <laughs> so there has to be a person out there who has like proportionally more memory than you have. Yeah. That's me. I'm just selective in my memory. Um, with no power over that selective part. You just remember whatever. <laughs> um, you know, but you've got other redeeming qualities. That, <laughs> Why, that, thank you. <laughs> the, 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 the fact that you're not a human encyclopedia for outdoor bits and pieces. Um, you know, that's my, my thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so what you're going to run into is... There's your best choice if weight is your key. Um, like I, uh, the Jetboil Minimo, um, because it's got a wider, it's a one liter pot, but it's wider. So it actually, and it's got a simmer adjustment on it. Yeah. Um, it's actually a great little pot if you're not just boiling water. That's cool. Like it's a pot and stove combo. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I like with the jet boils, uh, is that the pot is insulated and it's got a handle on it. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, stove and the pot click together yeah. like they're you know like a key lock system so in the winter time you literally can stand there holding your pot as it burn like it, as it boils mm -hmm. um so they're a great little system um if you are cooking um and not just boiling water um and you're you're not obsessed with just having the lightest right uh they do a great job um, I know people who run a titanium pot, but they don't run the lid because uh, they can run, they basically get some uh, heating duct, uh, basically tape, um, you know, that you'd put on heating ducts and uh, cover a piece of uh, uh, ultralight aluminum. And that's their lid for their pot because it's lighter than the actual pot lid. Right, so the, the, there is going too far. Yeah, I would uh, say. Um, you know, I find my nice little titanium pot. Um, it does its job. Uh, it, it's pricey, but titanium will never corrode. It'll last forever as long as you don't crush it. Uh, Easier to clean? Um, yeah, but only from the standpoint, it's got less divots and stuff inside the pot than yours does. Okay. Um, so getting the oatmeal out is easier. Yeah. Now, one of the pluses too, and this goes with any pot, if you're not 100% perfect with cleaning food out. I was just going to say, that's me. Yeah. Um, the plus you have as far as like, say, bacteria buildup is even if you only cook dinner, 
every day you're boiling that pot. So you're getting the, the temperature of the pot to the point where any bacteria buildup will be killed. Right. Um, so as long as you bring that water to a boil. Who cares? Yeah. That you're a pig. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do your dishes. Um, so, yeah. So then from there, um, like I said, the alcohol stoves. Uh, the advantage is, is versatility as far as finding fuel. Um, but... Whereas like our, our pocket rockets take three to three and a half minutes to boil a liter of water, they'll take seven to eight minutes to boil it, and they don't have a shut off. So once you've lit that, you've put the liquid fuel in and you've lit it. Yeah. Well, now you gotta let that. Or you got to find a way to snuff it out. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of a pain in the I ass. I think it's a pain in the butt. You know, it's it's cool. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't mind getting the jet boil just for a few moments, you know, especially when it's windy. You want the I, more so. I just want my water to boil quickly so that mm-hmm. my fuel will last longer. Yeah, and and that's the trade off. The jet boils and the and the wind burners from MSR, uh, they boil water quicker, but they're a little heavier. All right. So you save weight and fuel, but you add. So if you're on a longer trip you will actually save weight overall because you don't have to carry as much fuel. Gotcha. So let's go to utensils. Yes. So it's simple. Sea to Summit, long-handled spork. Yep, you got it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, it's perfect. It's nice. It's it's quite, it's quite. got a nice tall or long handle, right? It's especially when you're making your dehydrated meals, you want to mix things around and or eat right out of the bag. Yeah. You can do that easily. It's quite durable because I find the plastic sporks, forks, whatever, break over time. So it's the way to go. Yeah. And it, it, there, there's other stuff out there, but I've never found anything that works as well as the Sea to Summit long handle spork. Yeah. Um, it's ultra light. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've had like a, a Primus titanium folding one. Oh, yeah. But it eventually broke. Okay. And the Sea to Summit never had an issue. So uh, that's one of those things that we're just unanimous on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. What about coffee uh, gear? I see, uh, by the way, everybody, uh, Winston's got a great article on all of this that you can refer to on our, our website, livewildradio.com. And you talk a little bit about coffee gear. Yeah, so... Um, For all you addicted yeah. coffee drinkers. So we're going to... Essentially, we're talking caffeine delivery systems, right? Um, fundamentally. And I realize some people have like a... Uh, a hipster kind of connection to coffee too, but we're just going to (laughs) start, treat it like a caffeine delivery system. So first we're going to go, if you're a regular coffee drinker, you like consuming caffeine, um, the lightest way to go is take caffeine tablets with you, right? So basically no dicking around. Uh, Two tablets is two cups of coffee. (laughs) Um, So that's simple. Right. Yeah, you just don't want to over caffeinate. I can tell you a few crazy stories about me over caffeinating because I'm not used to drinking that much coffee. And you feel like you're gonna faint and Yeah, and you didn't do that with caffeine tablets. You did that with just coffee. And uh what's that energy drink? Because oh, we left hours. at four AM to the Adirondacks, a seven hour trip. Never do that again. Yeah. So I'm driving. So and, and you're drinking you're drinking coffee, like multiple coffees along the way, five hour energy. Yeah. Uh, those little weird bottles of so soap. So I had about two coffees, extra large, that fire, five hour energy, get on the trail. And I'm not feeling so good. No. So just FYI. Yeah. Uh, I think if you have enough caffeine, it starts to make you feel like you're on meth. Never done meth, but I think the way Catherine was asking or yeah. acting, yeah. Uh, it's sort of like uh, X amount of caffeine equals meth. Oh, here's another funny story. Uh I, because I'm on the keto diet, wanted to make sure I had enough electrolytes. Winston says, oh, we'll take four pills of, uh, what was it called? Enduralites. Enduralites. Uh, I was on an empty stomach. That well, with, that, that wasn't the only thing you took. I know. What else did I take? MCT oil. Yeah. And protein powder. And protein powder. I was sick as a dog. Sweating. Yeah. Throwing up, but the sweat just before throwing up. Oh my god! You sweated as much as I do. I felt like I was going through withdrawal. I've never that, but I felt shitty. Yeah, too much stuff, or your system's going fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> so, just saying. <laughs> if you're if you're trying anything, try it small doses. Don't try it on the trail. Yeah, just um, saying. Even so, caffeine. All right, let's yeah, move so, on. So so basically, you can go caffeine tablets. Um, you can go 
a single serving instant coffee, right? So your Starbucks, Vias, I think they're called, or, you know, like everybody makes it. You can even get those ones where it's like coffee, cream, and sugar. Awesome. You just dump it in the, in your, you know, whether your pot or your mug. Joe Traders has that. Oh, Trader Joe's. Yeah. What, what is it with you saying everything backwards? I sometimes wonder if I'm dyslexic. But only audible. Verbal. Verbally dyslexic. Yes. Because <laughs> in climbing, hey, we, we use something um, called a stick clip to clip your first bolt. Yeah. And you call it a clip stick. Yeah. I, yeah, I have no shame. I do that sometimes. No, so I'm, I, just, I'm just, you know, it's sort of one of those, it's like I'm being Jerry Seinfeld. I'm just observing things. <laughs> It just makes me wonder. And guess what? I don't care. All right. Well, I, no, I, I'm not, I know, no, I'm not no, trying I, to make I, you feel bad. I know. I, I I'm know. just wondering where it comes from. Yeah. No, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like the whole, you know, Japanese read their articles backwards. Like yeah. their news. I actually naturally, maybe I should have been born in Japan, but I naturally pick up a magazine and want to start backwards. <laughs> you just start with like the classifieds in the back? I do. Oh, whatever. Um, so you can do your single serving, you know, instant coffees. But then you get into the, the coffee aficionados. And that's where you can get coffee presses, um, coffee grinders. Horse coffee. Uh, yeah, Kicking okay, Horse is really good coffee. Um, you can get uh, percolators. You can get um, uh, miniature espresso machines. Uh, Have you seen this on the AT, by the way? No. Everybody just does the instant. Okay. Um, just checking. But what you'll get, it's, again... It's blamping, because not glamping, because that's really just fancy car camping. Gotcha. But people backpack glamping, right? They're glamour camping, or I don't know where glamping Whatever. comes from. But, but it's sort of luxuriating in their backpacking. Um, again, it comes down to the, the, the less far you're going each day, um, or maybe you're an Uber athlete, so you just don't give a fuck. Uh, you know, the fitter you are, the more shit you can carry. So you can you can bring your espresso machine or your, uh, and and it's kind of cool because like some companies like GSI um, make a number of different types of coffee apparatus, right? They do coffee presses, they do percolators, they do espresso makers, um, grinders. It's a ritual. Yeah, like they realize that some people, you know. They like to keep their um, addiction respectable. Uh, so, you know, they're because it, it, it's almost like anything. You take and, you know, shoot up heroin and you're bad. But you, you make a perfect, you know, uh, little cup of espresso for your little fix. And it's fancy. <laughs> yeah. So no, no, no shot on anybody who likes to do that. It's all available. Yeah. So you can still, for people who are gourmets when they go out. Um, there is hope yeah and that basically is one of those things where uh i'm not somebody traveling with fresh ingredients um i'm trying to be sort of light and efficient and i'm lazy uh you know getting me to cook at home uh you know like basically if i could have like somebody else cook for me all the time although you've been cooking for me lately (laughs) Uh, yeah. Which is really sweet. You know, but but it, it, it it's not sort of, I don't take great pleasure in it. You know, some people, no, some people really. Cooking for me? No. Why are you doing it? It's Why a, you offer? It's efficient. Because you're faster than me. Yeah. And I don't burn stuff. You uh, don't like my cooking? Oh, I like a lot of your cooking, but you do tend to like, um, be li- you, you were impatient in your pan heating up, so you always turn the pans to high. Which is where then everything gets scorched. So if I keep that up, you'll keep cooking for me. Oh, I'll cook anyway. Like, but it, <laughs> you know, but, it, but it, the thing is, if you notice, almost all of my cooking is one pot. No, because I'm when you're cooking, I'm in the living room relaxing. Oh yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> um, but anyway. either way, so lots and lots of coffee options. Um, so you don't have to be without your cup of Joe. Um, however you want it, you're not going to have fresh cream if that's your thing. Uh, but you can still have pretty good coffee. Right. Food storage. So there's sort of two two areas we need to look at here. Number one is uh, how you cart it around, you know. Um, and then number two is how you store it. So When you're at a campsite. Yeah. Um, so 
you're going to run into the thing where uh, I always recommend stripping all packaging down and repackaging everything in freezer Ziploc bags. Um, even if you can like subdivide for days, uh, basically, then it's easy to figure out. Because, Efficient. Yeah, because one of the things I see so often, like especially with new backpackers, is that they go out with uh, food and they come home with half of it because they took way too much. Mm-hmm. Right, but if you can break down, okay, this is for today, this is for tomorrow, this is for the next day, this right. Is, right, and and you've subdivided your days, and and figured, oh, okay, do you think that'll be enough for lunch? Okay, I'll add an extra granola bar, or I'll add something. Yeah. Right. Okay, this is my trail mix for each day, um, and you broke it down, then it actually makes uh, your planning much much easier. Um, and that's where the, the freezer Ziploc bags are tough enough that they'll uh, stand up to sort of multiple use. Um, then you have the question of uh, basically at night, where are you storing your food? Uh, because animals um, are an issue. Um, everybody's freaked out by bears. Um, but it's actually all like raccoons, mice, right. squirrels. Uh, the mini bears, we'll call them, um, that are actually much more of an issue, but you still don't want to have a bear come in your camp. Mm -hmm. So you're really looking at two things. Number one um, is going to be hanging your food. uh, And that's where having like a uh, pretty pretty rugged dry bag, usually about 10 liters uh, and like 50 feet of paracord or accessory cord that you can get it up in a tree um, but here's the guideline. If you are going to hang your food, you want the bag 12 feet off the ground, six feet down from a branch, six feet out from the trunk, right? Cause bears can climb trees. Squirrels can climb trees. I'm sure they can. Yeah. Um, so the idea then is that it's inaccessible. Yeah. Um, or you can go the route that we do, which is we actually take bear resistant canisters. Um, we use the Garcia engineering. About a hundred bucks. Yep. Um, it's good for about what? Uh, it's ten four liters. or five days of. It weighs two and a half pounds. Yeah. Good for about five days of food. I can do seven. Yes, you eat very little, and and that's another note. I'm gonna just really emphasize this. I personally, I'm curious if you are the same. I eat a lot less when I'm backpacking, both winter and summer. How about you? Um, Let's just focus on summer right now. Yeah, because when you're exercising all day, your body is burning a lot of fat. Um, so if you've already got abs, you're going to need to bring more food mm-hmm. when you don't have abs like me, or you just have one a nice round one, um, <laughs> then your, your body actually has body fat that it can tap into and burn. Um, so you'll, re- Sweet. yeah, long backpacking trips. Um, if you were, uh, I'm just trying to think of the politically correct ways to put this overweight. No, no. Um, if you have a dad bod, okay. if you're thick, yeah. uh, if you're curvy, uh, you know, uh, if you're husky. Well, I'm just trying to come up with like politically yeah. correct ways of saying, yeah. you know, you, you don't have abs that anybody else can see. Yeah. Um, you can actually get away with less food because your body's got a lot of fat that it can burn as you're hiking. Yeah. Um, it's not that you don't need any food. Um, don't recommend that but i generally find that uh you know doing really long days um i i don't find myself super hungry neither do i yeah i drink a lot of water for yeah. sure way more water than nor- i normally only drink a liter or two liter- if t- if i'm like two liters a day which is not even enough on a backpacking trip at least you, three four <laughs> yeah like you're bound to down water <laughs> yeah it's also my safety blanket. If yeah, I'm it's like if afraid. she's working hard. Yes, you know, if I'm working hard. Or afraid. She or drinks afraid. Water. It's my, yeah, hey, I've had, hey. could be worse vices. But um, it's interesting how you don't really eat that much, I yeah. find. Yeah, like for the amount of exercise we're doing, we're not eating as much. Yeah. Like, and this is the thing, in civilian life, um, you know, and that's when I'm not on the trail, uh, I eat a lot of times out of boredom. Right, it's like my life lacks kind or of anxiety, or whatever your yeah. thing is. But yeah. you know, with a lot of it, like with me, it's like you know, I'm one of these people that's got to sort of have something going on, or I just fucking get bored. Yeah. 
Um, and that's, that's part of what I like about, you know, when I do these big trips and these big adventures, I'm not bored. Mm-hmm. Like that's, you know, I love everything I'm doing and all that kind of stuff. But fundamentally, one of the things is is that um, I'm stimulated. Right. Um, I'm not bored. Like every, like life is vibrant. <laughs> um, you know, like, like it, it just feels like you're, you're. You don't need food to fill it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, although I still fantasize about what I'm going to eat when I get to town. You talk and you ask everybody about yeah. their fantasy. What are, you, what are you thinking about when we <laughs> get I'm to like, town? I don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. You, like you, you ruin it. Like at least, <laughs> you know. No. I don't care. And Katie, if you listen to this, I, I want to say like, you, that's one of the things that made you a great hiking companion is like, you would always have good ideas, you know, uh, you wouldn't go, I don't, I don't care. No, she would be like, oh, I would really like French, uh, French onion soup and, and, yeah. um, with like bread to dip in it and da, da, da. And it's like, oh yeah, well, I'd really like, it. you know, and so you'd have these yeah. great food conversations. Yeah. I just want to go for a swim. We'll go fucking go for a swim then. Yeah. You know, like that's not a, that's not what I asked you. Yeah, well. It's like, what would you like to eat? I want to go for a swim. <laughs> that's kind of that non sequitur answer that gets you put in one of them padded rooms. Oh, okay, we need to move on. Yeah. All right, all right. So I I diverted you from storage, and we talked about hanging. Um, yeah, so, so hanging f- you can bear hang and you can do a canister. The nice thing with a canister, it is heavier than a, a dry bag and some rope, but um, you don't have to ever find a proper tree to hang it from. Yeah, it makes a stool. Um, listen, if a 1,200-pound grizzly can't get in it, your fat ass ain't breaking it. But what? beware, because in the Adirondacks, at one of the hiker camps in, in the backcountry, so uh, Culver, Culver Lake? Colden Lake. Colden Lake. Lake Colden, but yeah. Yeah, I had heard, because it's high bear activity, and I heard them in the middle of the night. But, um, you know, it's not enough to just store your food away, but when you go get your food leave it where it is away from your campsite get what you need and only that because a woman had it at her campsite bears fucking smart they'll come they'll like scare her because they're just there and they eat all her food well and see so that uh, that's the thing because the the bear canister has a lid that sort of snaps in place and it has two screws right in this case she brought it it was all open and all of a sudden she was startled by a bear right and then there. she ran away and then the bears if, if if the bears come put the lid back on lock it back in place and then leave um, because the, here's the thing, we think we're protecting our food from the bear, but what we're actually doing is protecting the bear from our food because bears that become habituated to human food that realize that, listen, if I go up and scare this person, I can eat their food. That bear's going to get shot. Yeah, it's a nuisance right. And th- it, like basically a, a bear that eats human food is a bear that's got a death sentence. Pretty much. And that's right? our fault. Yeah. yeah. Right, so that's the the part that we really need to to stay on top of. Yeah, of course, you don't want to be in the middle of like a five day trip and have all your food gone, right? Because then you got to um, how the hell am I getting out? <laughs> I guess I'm going to go hungry for a couple of days. Right. But um, it's your responsibility to manage your food. Uh, so that's just you know a public service announcement. Um, people don't often think of it that way. They're worrying, oh, the bear's going to come for my food. Yeah, but we also don't want the bears to be needlessly have to be put down right and become sort of a, like a problem for other people oh, totally so um this is a good segue um now i think we're done on the gear bit no we're of, not we're not what are we missing uh garbage of course because uh and if you have a bear canister one of, one of the things when you go out on a trip take a one liter or one liter one gallon um, freezer Ziploc bag doesn't have to be Ziploc brand. You can go for the Walmart ones to save a little money. But um, a one gallon bag uh, is going to be, you know, when you have packaging, when you have whatever, um, it doesn't matter what it is. Whatever you took in, you take out with you, um, because a you don't want to go into a place that's just covered in garbage. Like, Catherine and I, when we're out, we're picking garbage up all the time. I hate that. Right? We were just at Rattlesnake Point, and, like, what did you pick up? Like, a bottle cap and a cigarette butt and... Fork. Some, a fork. A I plastic hate fork. I seeing that. Right? And this this is, like, a front country. This isn't back country. <laughs> um, but when we see that stuff in the back country, like, we were just in Queen Elizabeth Wildlands, and we carried out a beer can. Yeah. 
Um, you know, anytime we see garbage, we're going to try to get as much of it out as we can. Um, and so it's the thing. We don't leave garbage. We take out as much garbage as we can. If everybody sort of tries to do that, we make up for the assholes that just leave garbage out in the wilderness. Um, cause if you always take out more garbage than you took in, right? So you're picking out the pieces here and there, we're going to make, uh, uh, have these wilderness areas that are clean, oh, totally. right? Like they're going to seem like wilderness areas, you know, not, not only is it a case where, Hey, we want a pure nature experience or anything like that, but we also don't want to be contaminating um, the environment. Yeah. And uh, the animals and then our right to access it. Yeah. And like part of it can, uh, you know, depending on where your motivations come from, part of it can just be self-serving, right? Because if people fuck up areas, they're going to get closed. So, um, yeah. So clamp your ass. Yeah. Um, moving forward. So what do you, what are some great uh, types of camp food? What are the top best backpacking foods that you recommend? I'm a huge fan of Snickers bars. <laughs> okay. But it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh cliff bars like so so first i'm gonna I'm gonna talk about two different things one the things you can just eat and then the things that you have to cook okay um so and these are just mine um top three top three so my top three no cook things are the make your own trail mix mm-hmm. um and you can make that out however you want but you just want it calorically dense uh here's a little guideline like uh anything that would be terrible to eat at home because it would just make you fat um, is what you want to eat when you're out there. Right. Um, you know, like nuts, chocolate, dried fruit. You can also um, do like bars. Okay. Um, so that'll be cliff bars, protein bars, granola bars, just because they're open to eat them. Um, and then uh, chocolate bars. I'm the same. Except for you're not allowed to anymore. I know. Okay, so let's talk about the old Catherine. Same, except I'd add in sour keys because I love those. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a big Skittles fan. Like if we're talking, if we're talking just like jet fuel sugar. Skittles yeah. are good, and I cannot believe the difference because once I was having a protein bar, did nothing for me. I was as I was slogging up the, I don't know, one end of the Marcy. Yeah, we're going up the Marcy Ridge up to like Mount Marcy. In the Adirondacks with my backpack. And then next thing I had were Skittles and I just powered it through. And it was like, oh, look, I have jet fuel now. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's like Um, if you ever watch any of the Fast and Furious movies, it's like the NAS, the nitrous oxide. (laughs) It is. It's like. It's it's amazing. I've never experienced You just got to keep eating them or you're going to run out of gas. Yeah, yeah. But I'm on the keto diet uh, for over three months now, sometimes lately. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but uh, I really honestly don't snack a lot. If I do, it's going to be almonds or chocolate, dark chocolate, at least 85, about 85% cocoa. Uh, and that seems to work for me and that's enough. It's so dense and fat and um, lots of calories that I just, and the whole keto diet, you don't eat a lot. Mm-hmm. You drink a lot, but that's about it. Yeah. But um, my other go-tos that I love when I'm not on the keto diet is uh, oatmeal. And I add in, because I did this by accident once, uh, nuts and some chocolate. A handful a handful of trail mix. Oh, it's amazing. It is so good. Yeah. Now what I do with my keto diet is I have a porridge made of chia seeds and... Hemp fla- seeds. Hemp and- seeds and flax seeds and uh, MCT oil and all this stuff. But I also add in there um, coffee. Mm-hmm. Like a, you know, so I just, it, it doesn't all, in vanilla and yeah, it's okay. It's, it's actually, interestingly enough, from a keto perspective, my breakfast is half the weight, half the weight per serving because it's so dense. Yeah. Cause it, it basically fat calories there, there's nine calories per gram of fat, mm-hmm. but four grams of calories per gram of carbs or protein. So if you think of it from that standpoint, um, one gram of fat has twice as many calories, so you don't have to eat as many yeah. calories or as many grams. Yeah, it's really interesting. For yeah. the same number of calories. Yeah, And then I have to say that on keto or not, I really like some of the canned fish that I've been getting for keto diet, which mm. is my favorite, cod. 
It is amazing. It is so good. Yeah, and the rest of the, the weird pâtés she eats, it's like cat food. Okay, tuna pâté is amazing. Love it. Anything else, not so much. Um, I'm going to... one, one I'm going to say those are my two favorite, yeah. tuna pâté and cod. One, one of these trips, I'm going to substitute some cat food and see if she can tell the difference. <laughs> She's like, oh, this pate is yummy. It's like, it's fancy feast. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, it's good. It, it's good. And um, the other thing that I do, more so when I'm car camping, although you can do it maybe on the first night, um, is um, take an avocado mm-hmm. and basically make guacamole because it's a whole avocado. Now you're carrying the pit and everything else. But if you have a fire that night, you can at least burn no. the skin. Yeah, yeah, I guess you could. Not the pit, the pit yeah. you're carrying out. But it's um, it's vegetable, it's fat. Um, oh, yeah, bacon, bacon chips. Yeah. So I pre- cook those in advance in the oven freeze them take them with me they can sit for a couple of days in my backpack because they're cured anyway mm. and um those are really tasty okay yeah because my i find i eat so much less on the keto diet as you explained yeah. already because of the calories right well and one of the other things that i'm a, a big fan of um are any types of cured meats um jerky pepperettes certain types of sausages cheeses yeah i gotta um, figure out what kind of cheese that was that ryan got me the hard cheese it was so it's expensive yeah so good like like this cheese was priced like cocaine <laughs> this liver was 10 bucks yeah it was so good it was salty it was so like good. like the little man goes hey you you want some of the cheese it I, was so i got good. i got you some cheese and like you know they give it in a brown paper bag and you slip them the money Oh my god it's like cheese drugs yeah um, yeah so uh, a couple of other things that uh uh make good sort of on the go snacks like i said cured meats mm-hmm. um hard cheeses will last a few days yeah uh then um i'm a big fan of uh kind of like the the make your own like kind of muffin, you know, it's like a protein energy muffin thing. Um, I, I don't make them very often, but yeah, I was gonna say. they're kind of like, they got oats in them. It's almost like making your own Cliff Bar. Oh, okay. Um, People make like little balls. Cookie dough, yeah. Um, and then, then let's be honest, one of the other things as far as no cook goes is peanut butter and bagels yeah. or, or tortillas. Like one of my favorite snacks breakfasts meals is i take a tortilla because they travel well and i put an obscene amount of peanut butter on it and then a handful of trail mix for crunch roll it up yeah soups are great going back to the ramen noodles when i can have them but even if i'm not just the broth yeah i find the broth with actually pork rinds i know people are like what (laughs) again i just started eating them because of keto because it's all fat and but you, you stick that into your soup. It's it's so filling. I even add in some mussels, canned mussels. Yeah, she's making the weirdest shit while we're out there now. Well, hey, I'm... Like, I'm just eating like a poor college student when I'm on the trail. Hey, it's <laughs> whatever. It's But it's calories, right? Yeah. And I'm trying to make it interesting. So, I mean, the one time I had heartburn, I had so much fat. Oh, we should probably talk about that. Tums. Tom's is good. Oh, hey, you're the keto person. Yeah. But let's talk about the booze math. Booze math? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So we're talking about food. Because um, I and, uh, basically, before we get to the booze math, I do want to get to my top three cooking foods. Okay. So Shoot. number one would be sort of your your store-bought dehydrated meals, like Mountain House meals, Alpenair. Of course. A lot of those are really good. They're not cheap. Like, you know, you're looking at 10 bucks of, each. Yeah, 10 bucks a meal. Um, but you're out for a couple nights. It's simple. You eat it, you basically boil water, put it in the bag, stir up the food, zip it up, let it sit for 15 minutes. Your dinner's cooked. Yeah. And a lot of them are really good. And I think it's at least two cups of food, um, if not more, is what it yields. Well, it's two servings. Two servings? Yeah. yeah. So in the summertime, I find you can easily share that with somebody else. In the wintertime, I know we're not talking really winter backpacking, but as an FYI, you'll eat the whole thing. Yeah. Um, in the winter, you need more calories to stay warm. Yeah. Um, so those are number one. Um, not cheap, but simple, 
tastes good, lots of calories, uh, easy to make. And sodium, yeah. Yeah. Uh, number two, uh, and this is one of my favorite, is Idahoan instant mashed potatoes in the single serving pouch. So you just have to add two cups of water. Um, you know, so boil two cups of water, dump the package in, and then I cut up pepperettes or salami or something like that and mix it in. I let it sit for a few minutes because it's too hot to eat. And literally it's ready to go. I just got to let it cool down. Um, but the combination of the carbohydrates from the mashed potatoes and you have like a thousand different flavors available, like, you know, garlic butter or all dressed or three cheese. Yeah. Um, that with the, with the meat in it, um, is spectacularly good. Um, and then my other favorite, I call it forest pad thai. Um, I hope nobody's upset with me for cultural appropriation. Um, but I take a ramen noodle, actually I usually take two packets, um, and uh, I will, you know, make those in my pot, um, because usually one ramen noodle calls for 500 milliliters of water, but I will do two packages of noodles in 500 milliliters of water, right? But it will rehydrate. Then I will take a handful of beef jerky and put in it, and then a big scoop of peanut butter and mix it in. Right. So if you've ever had pad thai, it's noodles, whatever meat. Um, Obviously, there's the pad thai flavors, um, but but it'll have peanuts in it. Uh, So that kind of mix of like the salty um, broth, uh, noodles, peanut, meat. Um, Because when you put jerky into any dehydrated, like, you know, or or rehydrate, um, it actually starts to be like it rehydrates. Now it's like stewed beef. Yeah. As opposed to like chewy jerky. Um, so that it, that ends up being a fun way to uh, make a high calorie, high protein, um, high carb meal. Sounds delicious. Yeah. Um, so those are my three favorite cooking meals. Um, so now before we're, we're going to go back to the booze math. So um, when we're trying to minimize weight, uh, water... Like if you look at most alcohol, right? Like beer is 5% alcohol on average. Uh, the rest of it, 95% of it's water. Um, whiskey uh, is 40% alcohol. Um, so, you know, if we're, the part that gets you a buzz um, is the alcohol, right? We all understand this. So um, uh, one, of, one of the tricks, if you want to... Uh, carry the least amount of weight because you can always filter more water um, which we'll get to in a minute Um, so there's no point in carrying the water like if we're talking multi-day backpacking so the trick is um, find the ridiculous stuff Um, down in the states you can get Everclear they actually like I think it's like 80% alcohol Um, we've at the duty free crossing into the states we've seen the rum that's 75% alcohol Um, that's what you want to carry. Because now picture, uh, put a little bit of alcohol, like, you know, like the f- high proof alcohol, um, and it, it'll, it'll sub as fuel for your alcohol camp stove too. Um, <laughs> at the bottom of a bottle, put a little packet of Crystal Light, fill the rest up with, you know, filtered mountain stream water. And now you have, you know, um, mountain forest punch uh, <laughs> at way less weight. Yeah. Per buzz. Yeah. Right? Because if we were to bring red wine, we just had some red wine this evening, 13.5% alcohol. Yeah. Well, most of it was water. Right? So you got to carry more of it. Uh, and so that's sort of the key with booze math. Um, if you want to maximize the amount of buzz, minimize the amount of weight, uh, but without being sloppy drunk, um, you want to have uh, the highest proof possible and if you get sort of the really neutral stuff um then you can just have a little bit in the bottom of your bottle um your mio or your crystal light um fill it up and you you have maximized your alcohol uh to weight ratio you've got it all down pat (laughs) yeah uh yeah so booze staying hydrated 
Very we important. Doing, a, doing a booze and staying hydrated. <laughs> I'm trying important. to do a segue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How'd I do? You're like a mall cop in a segue, just zipping around, <laughs> your little two wheel cart. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so water purification yes. as we, we can move on to that. I mean, uh, why stay hydrated? So important. I mean, uh, first of all, um, if you don't stay hydrated, you're going to get stupid. Yep. Especially in, uh, and you can get dehydrated by the way, not only in the summer, but in the winter too. Yep which is interesting. Um, getting stupid means you just can't think anymore. Your brain doesn't function. Yeah, and you're making bad decisions. You are. And actually, it's when you get sometimes get in that state that injuries happen. So it's easy to stumble. And yeah, it's just a downward, downward spiral. So you got to make sure that works. So, um, you know, there are different ways to purify water. So let, let's break them down. So you can always boil water um, to kill both um, let's actually take a step back and be c- what's in the water. Yeah. So you can have uh, basically bacteria, parasites, viruses, um, and then contamination. Um, and so that could be farm fertilizer, heavy metals, what have you. Like that that contamination we're not particularly worried about because most of the, the water sources we're looking are backcountry. Mm-hmm. Um and so they're they're away from civilization. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're really concerned with bacteria, parasites, and viruses. Um, now, boiling water will kill those. Um, the The downfall of boiling is a if you're using your stove, uh, it takes up fuel. Um, it's slow, and then it's hot. And then you have to cool the water down to a point where you can actually drink it. Um, so in the winter, we will actually boil water for disinfecting the water, um, you know, because we got to be melting snow anyway for our water. Uh, so it's a kind of, you're already having to heat it up, so you might as well bring it to a boil. Um, if you are going to boil water to disinfect it, um, you need to bring it to a rolling boil for a full minute, um, at our altitude, like between sea level and 5,000 feet, above 5,000 feet, you need to bring it to a rolling boil for three minutes. Uh, and the reason is, is that at a higher altitude, water boils at a lower temperature, and it's the temperature that kills bacteria and viruses and parasites, not boiling itself. It just happens to be that the temperature that water boils at sea level is also the temperature that kills everything. Um, so, uh, basically one minute at sea level, three minutes above 5,000 feet, you know, simple little thing to remember. Um, then from there, uh, you'll run into chemical treatment. Um, if you've ever had some tap water, that's a little chlorine you've experienced chemical treatment from your local water treatment plant. Um, and, uh, they also, um, filter. So it's filter the big particles out and then they chemically treat like in your, you know, municipal water. Um, although, uh, and this is kind of a funny little, not funny, but interesting aside, um, a number of municipalities are actually going to UV treatment. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and that's where people have shrunk it down. That's where it started because uh, ultraviolet will kill microorganisms as well. Mm. Um, so it does both. Yeah. Uh, huh. Uh, so people have like this Steri pen. They have shrunk down the ultraviolet into literally it's a UV pen, and you take up a, a jug of you know uh, stream or lake water and stir the pen in it, turned on for forty five seconds. Really? And it's supposed to uh, kill the water or not kill the water, but kill any of in it in the water. And so it's the, at that point, it's just a battery that you need to replace every so often. Yeah. And there's some that are rechargeable. Gotcha. Uh, the, the How issue, much does that go for? Uh, they're basically between 60 and a hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, you know, my big thing with them is that, uh, unlike some of the stuff we're going to talk about, uh, they really require being used properly. I would say, um, and the battery has to work and, you know. Well, not only that, but sometimes you have droplets of water that probably won't co- come in contact with the UV rays. I'm talking about what's on the... On, on, on the lid. On the lid, on the top, whatever. Yeah. You know, because your pen is below that, right, as you put it into the bottle. Yeah. I could see that 
screwing that up. Yeah. And so the the lab testing shows, you know, it's sort of in a controlled environment it works. Um, Outside's not a controlled environment. So I'm not, I don't recommend them. Yeah. Um, I don't use them myself. Uh, you know, and w- basically chemical treatment um, will usually come in the form of either drops mm-hmm. uh, or individual tablets that are already calibrated it's usually chlorine dioxide yeah just like is used in municipal water um so uh, one tablet will disinfect one liter of clear water um and so if the the water source you're filtering or or you're collecting your water from is kind of murky and cloudy um pre-filter it first Mm -hmm. and that could just be through a bandana yeah. Um, or let the sediment settle down and then pour it off. Yeah. Another trick that you have, um, you know, in terms of getting fresh water is try and get it at uh, a point where it's, um, you know, if it's coming down a river, like a waterfall. Yeah. It's moving. Um, moving water is always preferable to standing water. Mm-hmm. Why? Um, because the bacteria can't sit and grow in it. Gotcha. Right. It's, it's you know, like a, like a, you don't tend to get scummy creeks. Gotcha. But, you know, that are flowing. You know, that always tends to be nice and clear. But you'll get plenty of scummy ponds because <laughs> it's just sitting. Yeah. Where everything can grow. Um, and so uh, the Center for Disease Control in the U.S., um, you know, the, the, the fine science folks there, um, what they recommend is using both a microfilter uh, which is sort of the one we're going to talk about, and chemical treatment. Um, because chemical treatment will kill bacteria and viruses, but it may not kill all parasites. Um, filters will filter out, uh, you know, 99.99% of bacteria and parasites, but it won't kill viruses. Gotcha. So if you were to filter it first and then use the chemical treatment, um, your it's the safest practice. Gotcha. Um, but, yeah. But what know. do you do? I guess for us, we, we do one or the other. We, we prefer the chemical treatment or the filtering, which we tend to do more filtering. Yeah. Because the, the thing is, is the filtering gets all the crud out of your water too. Um, if the water's got a lot of tannins in it, so it's kind of like uh, brownie. Minerals and stuff, yeah. It ends up looking crystal clear. Yeah. It we- tastes better. Yeah, we have a good, a great photo, uh, having done that when we were on the Allegheny camping trip. Yeah, and this was from a well. At a campground. Yeah. Yeah, that was really interesting. Like the well water was coming out brownish. Yeah. So I just filled up my, like, and we'll short circuit this, like what I recommend, and I'm not a doctor, okay? Um, But I've, you know, my my intestines are still intact. I've never had any parasites. So actually, I shouldn't say that. You I shouldn't have. say that. I've had, I've had Giardia <laughs> in the past. But um, uh, I use the Catadyme B-Free. Yeah. Um, another really good uh, filter is the Sawyer um, Squeeze. Uh, it's what I've used for years. Um, the thing that I like with the B-Free is that it, it's just the flow rate is higher, but the, the filtration is the same. It's a 0.1 micron filter. Mm-hmm. So... Anything down to 0.1 microns is filtered out. Mm-hmm. Um, bacteria, parasites, um, because in most of the northern temperate, you know, waterways, because they freeze over the winter, um, b- viruses don't seem to be an issue. Um, bacteria and parasites are. So they filter out the bacteria and parasites. Um, you know, like I said, if you were worried. Okay, so wherever you're going, like Mexico and Southern. Yeah, anything warm. That doesn't freeze. Do both. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Good to know. Um, and, you know, my, my surmising because of the freezing, I could be full of shit why we don't have virus issues. It could be that just where our waterways are. Yeah. Um, that we're filtering are so far from human habitation. But... Uh, so if anybody, anybody's a microbiologist <laughs> who's listening and, and if I'm full of shit, do comment, to comment and let us know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, like I said, I filter, um, we always have chemical treatment. We always have aqua tabs with us. Mm-hmm. Um, cause like 50 aqua tabs and one tab will do a liter of water. Yeah. 50 tabs would fit in your pocket. Yeah. When, when you put the tablet in, uh, you do have to wait 30 minutes. That's the yeah. only downside to it. But I think it's highly worthwhile for not having to sit there and filter your water if your filter is not very quick. Yeah. 
And that's that's what we love about the Katadyne because it's two liters a minute. And sometimes too, when we were in Utah, there was so much sediment in the water that we wa- we didn't want to clog up our filter fil- filtration system. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So it depends on where your filter, like where your water sources are. Let's talk about, you know, if you can't get water, like you were, we were on that one part of our trip in the Utah Canyon and there was a lot of water and you're like, there's a little bit of water stream coming through here, but you just dug a hole. Yeah. So it'll take a while. So if you've got like just the barest trickle, um, coming down, um, one of the things you can do is dig a hole and let, let it settle. And now the little stream will fill it up and say using your mug or your pot. Now you can actually scoop up the water. Yeah. Whether that's putting it into a squeeze bag, like filtration system, like we do or filling bottles and then putting chemical treatment in. Um, uh, If you've got like a trickle coming down a wall, right? Like a spring coming out of a cliff or something like that. And it's barely a trickle. One of the cool little tricks is take a stick um, and, find a way to sort of wedge it in a crack. Yeah. And because of the water will actually start running down the stick and dripping off. Yeah. And now you can just hold your bottle under and fill it that way. But alternatively, you always have your cup. Yeah. To scoop something smaller. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. And it, it basically, if you if you can sort of scrape it out so now it fills up, yeah. um, you've created a little pool. Okay. Um, that works really well. What if you are, all the the creek beds are dried up, but you come across a swamp? So and that is your only water source. And I know you've told me that you can do this. Yeah. So um, if you're going to use, say, something like a, like a squeeze filter like we do with the Katadyne or the Sawyer, yeah. um, fill the bag. Um, but I would actually even like pre-filter putting it in the bag. Mm-hmm. Cause, so the way these filters work is you fill a bag with water, you thread the filter on, and then you squeeze the bag mm-hmm. through the filter. Right. And clean water comes out. Right. Um, so... Uh, If you're dealing with like gross swamp water, Mm -hmm. then I would use a bandana over the opening to the bag. So use a mug or your pot to pour it in, right? So you're you're pre-filtering any particulates out, you know, sediment, all that kind of stuff. Bandana, sock, whatever. Eggs, scum, whatever. Yeah, but I mean, but I mean, you're you're using a bandana, a sock, anything as a pre-filter to take it out. Yeah. Then you filter it with your actual micro filter. Then I would chemically treatment, yeah. chemically treat it. And would you just collect the water from like way below the surf, the top of the pond? Um, it, it depends on the, uh, you know, if you can clear, you want the clearest water you can get. Yeah. Right. So, and sometimes you just get stuff that's gross. Like there isn't anything clear. Yeah. Right. But if you can filter a lot of it out, like filter a lot of the particulate matter out, like the physical objects, then f- filter micro filter out the bacteria and parasites and then use the chemical treatment to kill anything that's left yeah. you're you're pretty safe so sometimes i've seen on crown land some tire tracks and let's say again there's water but all that's there is scum it's rainwater that's collected in these areas of a of a, of a trail yeah but you see like what looks like oil um, you're I, fucked. You're fucked. Like, don't, don't, you, go, don't touch it. Yeah. Or, or you basically, it's like, do you get slightly poisoned or die of dehydration? Yeah. Right now in Ontario. Obviously if water's collecting there, it might be collecting elsewhere. So yeah. And you start looking around like off where any motorized vehicles would be. Yeah. Um, you know, and the thing is water will pool in low ground. Yeah. Right. And so you can find an area that's like a dry Creek bed. You know, if we're talking those truly survival situations, dig. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, basically, just, you know, a foot or two under the ground. Yeah. Um, you'll actually get water. Yeah. Um, and then, it, you know, if you dig a hole and let it sit, it fills up. And then you go through this process of purifying it. Okay. So um, what I always thought was neat about all of this is that when you go on backpacking trips, um, you don't have to carry more than maybe, on average, we take about three liters with us at the most. Yeah, it depends on where you're going. At the end of the day, we're always watching out for the streams. Like, that's important, right? That's part of what's in your pack and how much water to take. But if you're walking by a riverbed all day, you don't need just take a liter. Yeah. And as you need it, get some. Um, I know you like to use your one liter smart water bottle bottles because they're thin and they fit nicely on the outside of your packs. Um, I personally like my bladder. 
you don't use a bladder. <clears throat> so camel back has a bladder that fits inside of your backpack and it has a tube that runs to the exterior of your yeah. backpack and you have it in front of you. I personally like it because it's um, easy for me to stay hydrated as I go. Whereas for you, you have to stop, you know, pull out your bottle. But I'm waiting for in. you, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're guilty often, and you have been, you know, you were dehydrated on that one trip with uh, the two girls when yeah. uh, you just didn't drink enough water. And typically, you don't drink enough water as you go, or at least that's me who drinks like six liters a day. You know, and and that's the thing. It's like you can go bottles, you can go hydration system, you know, like a bladder with a hose. You could do both. There, there's also the platypus bags. Um, which roll up it's, yeah. it's basically it's a soft water bottle yeah which i actually quite like that too for its compact nature and they usually come in about liter bags maybe some more other things to keep in mind um in hot sunny weather when you're sweating a lot is that you do lose electrolytes yeah so your sodium potassium magnesium selenium zinc uh so when it's hot and you're sweating a lot don't just drink water um, whether it's noon tablets, Endurolites from Hammer Nutrition, um, you know, electrolytes from, I don't care who it's from, but getting, uh, replacing not only the fluids you've sweated out, but the electrolytes. Um, you can actually die from drinking too much water um, because if all you're doing is drinking water, um, it actually dilutes the electrolytes that are left in your body. Um, so, uh, and then what happens is, is that, you know, you end up with these kind of arrhythmias and heart attacks and all sorts of things. Um, so uh, when it is hot and you are sweating buckets, um, just start adding electrolyte tablets um, to, to your water. And so you're replacing the electrolytes with all the fluid you're um, sweating out. Yeah. Yeah. How do you know if you've got enough water in your system? Um, How much often should you be peeing? Well, that varies because if you have caffeine, you'll pee more. Um, some people pee more than others. Uh, as long as you're feeling good. Yeah. If you're feeling good, um, your pee isn't coming out like the yellow of big bird. <laughs> okay. You know, like it should be straw, like clear or straw color, not like, you know, like basically like school bus yellow. <laughs> um, so if it, if it's you and you can tell even guys, you know, you're, might be trickier for ladies to sort of, you know, you got to be doing a lot of yoga to look at your pee as you pee. Um, but guys, as you're peeing, you can see what color it is, right? And it's like, yep, yeah, that's pretty dark, right? I, I better hydrate a bit more. Yeah. Um, and and if you're going long periods without peeing, um, basically your body is regulating yourself. So if if you're not urinating, mm-hmm. there's a good chance you don't have a whole lot of fluid in yourself, mm-hmm. you know? Um, it, and obviously then there's all the things of sweating and everything, but here's, here's, um, a piece of advice. Drink when you're thirsty. Like we have this very evolved Well, they sense. always say that when you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. So. Yeah. They're, they're, whoever says that's an idiot. All the, like the, the, the science behind it. Uh, and, and that the, basically if you're in an ultra endurance event, like we're doing a hundred mile bike race in the heat then that advice is true. Okay. Um, But doing normal things, like in in backpacking is normal, right? We're not doing a high level, you know, we're going long and low. Um, So you run into the thing where, uh, you know, as you hike, you're going to get thirsty. If you're thirsty, drink. Yeah. Um, If you're more thirsty, drink more. Well, one of the things that you always like to recommend is that before you start backpacking, getting set off on your trip, it's to drink a liter of water. Well, and the, no, not, but that's not before you start on your trip. That's just drink a liter with your breakfast. Yeah. Right? You're starting the day, Yeah. you know, hydrated because you went eight or nine hours with no fluid. Yeah. But often when you're getting more water, you're stopping because you probably need water. And you, But drink, t- chug down a bunch at that time. Yeah. Like whenever you're filtering water, get like, but the, it, it it's that thing where we're we're in this world now where it's like hydrate, 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 hydrate. But if you're not thirsty, um, you know, unless you've got like your 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 body's not in touch with itself. Yeah, but there still needs to be a minimum because I could easily just have a liter of water a day, and you're looking at me like that's not enough. Yeah, but the, you're weird. Like I I can't picture not being thirsty on a liter of water a day. 
right? Yeah. And my guess is, like, you're underestimating too, because you might drink a liter of water, but did you have a coffee in the morning? Mm-hmm. That's almost a liter right there, right? You know, like you're, well, a large coffee, uh, a large coffee. No, it's more than that. Like a lar- like Tim Hortons large, is more than five hundred. I think. Do you want to have a bet? Yeah. Yeah, five bucks. Okay. It's it's gonna be uh, five hundred mils, and you're saying it's more. Yeah. Yeah. All right, five okay. bucks. You guys are already. Um, okay. And then, uh, you know, so so it comes in. I think it's like, five hundred mil or less, and you're saying it's. Oh, more than five hundred. Yeah. yeah. So after this is over, next episode <laughs> we will let you know who, who won the bet. Yeah. Um. But yeah, like, obviously, drink regularly. Stay hydrated. You know, you don't want to get dehydrated. Yeah. But also, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, if you're not drinking every minute of the day, you're not going to die either. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to be captain, you know, sensible here. So, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully that gave you guys like a, a good primer. We've got the, the articles on the website um, on camp cooking, water purification. Um, we're getting recipes, you know, I'm going to be doing a shootout of like the best stoves, uh, and you know, why, um, and sort of my recommendation. Yeah. Um, Yeah, And I'll share out, share with some people who are considering the keto diet and how to do that on the backpacking trip. What are some ideas for meal plan? You just eat butter. All butter and protein powder. There you go. <laughs> That's gross. Just a stick of butter in one say, hand. I Winston made the best. I don't know if he can do this on the trip, but he made the, made the best keto pancakes today. Like you made. They're not keto pancakes. Sorry, you They're made propanine pancakes. Whatever, it's close. Well, enough. no, whatever matters. <laughs> <laughs> you made protein pancakes, and I looked at them. I'm like, I can't eat pancakes. You're like, oh, these are not just pancakes. I made them with your protein powder. And what else did you put in? Eggs. Uh, yeah, eggs, protein powder, um, MCT oil, and there was something else. Put vanilla or anything like that? No, but it was vanilla so protein powder. So delicious. Um, you didn't even need the dry. You didn't even need syrup because no. I was thinking, oh, this is going to be dry. No, no, they were super moist. Oh, they're so good. Even the burnt ones were good. Yeah. Yeah, because I got the pan a little too hot to start with. Um, but yeah, like there, there's all sorts of options. Yeah. Anyway, so stay tuned. Yeah. So read the articles and let us know if this is being helpful to you because that's the whole point of it. We, we, we have a love. We're kind of like all religious-like and we're spreading spreading our religion, uh, getting people into the outdoors. Yeah. And uh you know, we can't ever complain that people don't know things if nobody taught them. You got it. So, until next time. Work hard, play dirty. Bye-bye.